Well, welcome everybody and hello to the first of the little lectures from the School of Biological Sciences. My name is Paul Thompson. I'm a professor in zoology and biological sciences, but I'm based up in Cromarty uh, on the Murray Firth uh, at the Lighthouse Field Station, where my research group uh, do work on marine mammals and seabirds and other aspects of marine, marine ecology and where we do teaching, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So this year, the university is celebrating 525 years. In Cromarty, we're actually celebrating 30 years of, of work up here. And so what I want to do over the next 20 minutes or so is give you an overview of some of the work that we've carried out over that period, talking about the research and the training and the teaching, and at the end, giving you an insight into some of the careers that some of our, our students, in this case, uh, master's project students, uh, have gone on to carry out. But as my title suggests, I'm keen to highlight how much has changed over that period, uh, both in terms of our understanding of marine mammal ecology, but also in public attitudes and government legislation and protection for those animals. And that, of course, has translated into very different policy needs and needs for scientific data and indeed needs for skills amongst our graduates. So we've tried to adapt our, our research and teaching programme to, to accommodate that. Prior to us starting this work, um, marine mammals in Scotland were probably seen very much as a, a resource to be uh, harvested uh, or uh, alternatively as a nuisance, which I'll come on to. And it wasn't that long ago that uh, there were Scottish whaling stations around the coast uh, on, uh, on Harris in the Western Isles and Shetland, and they were taking species like fin whales and even the occasional blue whale. And right up until the 1960s, a lot of the Antarctic whaling was actually being carried out by Scottish companies. So we have a long history of exploiting marine mammals as a resource. But when I started working on marine mammals in the 1980s as a PhD student in Aberdeen, uh, there'd uh, just been introduced a moratorium on commercial whaling, but there were still very strong feelings about potential competition between marine mammals and commercial fisheries, particularly seals, but, but also cetaceans. And uh, it was realised that it needed to be much better scientific information to support evidence-based management and making some of these tricky decisions about uh, how we should be managing some of these populations. Well, throughout our time in Cromarty, we've been trying to uh, support those kinds of management decisions. And we've done that through, I suppose, three threads of work. Uh, there is the research and we've carried out long-term uh, research, particularly focusing on harbour seal and bottlenose dolphin populations in the Murray Firth, but also more recently on harbour porpoises. And whilst the questions that we may have been asking have changed and the drivers for those questions have changed, the, the core work has uh, continued in a, in a similar way. And then we have our teaching and training where we contribute to courses down in Aberdeen, but also have uh, student field courses up in Cromarty and also host students carrying out their uh, independent research projects, either as master students or on the students. But it's not just about what happens within the university. Uh, we're also keen to support the various management and conservation uh, activities that go on around us, uh, working with government, with industry and, uh, and with NGOs to improve management and conservation. And what the Murray Firth gives us with a real mix of different human activities and um, different wildlife populations is a case study where we can look at some of these uh, issues, we can contribute to regional management, but also that provides insights into how we might study or manage populations of marine mammals in other areas across the world. So I suppose if I had to describe my, my science, I'd say I'm a population ecologist. I'm interested in how environmental variation uh, affects uh, marine top predator populations, so marine mammals such as the, the harbour seals and the bottlenose dolphins, but also uh, also seabirds. But we're particularly interested in how individuals within those populations behave. And so the work that uh, I've carried out with many colleagues over the years uh, has been very much focusing on following individuals in those populations. The bottlenose dolphins and the seals we recognise from natural marks on their pelage or their fins. The seabirds, we mark them with colourings that allow us to follow them. Porpoises, uh, actually you can't recognise them individually and that constrains some of those studies. But that approach has uh, been continued 
through throughout that period. And of course, with environmental variation, some of that is natural environmental variation, but some of it is down to things that we're doing to the environment as humans. And so what we're trying to do is disentangle those things where we can perhaps change the way we go about uh, our human activities to improve management and reduce potential impacts on these important wildlife populations. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, marine mammals were often seen as a, a bit of a nuisance, and that was certainly the case uh, amongst fishermen around Scotland in the, in, the, in the 1980s and before. And when we first arrived in the area, we were particularly looking at interactions between harbour seals and um, salmon fishermen in, in the Murray Firth. Lots of important uh, salmon rivers and important for commercial netting and also um, rod, and, rod and line fishery. And there'd been calls for culls because of perceived in increases in uh, in seals in these local estuaries, but we didn't know very much about how the populations were really changing, whether they ate salmon all the time, where they fed. So our studies were trying to understand more about their diet, sifting through scat samples to look at the, the many different species they actually eat, tracking uh, individuals, showing that they spend quite a lot of time out at sea as well as uh, in the estuaries, and that actually it's a much more complex issue than uh, it was often painted at the time. But around that time, we also saw the first of uh, a couple of major mass deaths of harbour seals, in, particularly in the southern North Sea, where around about 50% of some of those populations died from foci distemper virus. And there were concerns that that may have been related to uh, pollution and, uh, and other human activities. And so that was a bit of a step change in people's concerns about some of these seal populations worrying about their uh, their conservation status as much as worrying about there being too many as a competition with fisheries. And more recently, there have been uh, continue to be harbour seal declines throughout Scottish waters. And, uh, and now government is much more concerned about what might be driving some of those declines in populations rather than worrying about uh, whether or not there are too many. The uh, well, international agreements at that time were also uh, sort of undertaking efforts to improve coastal water quality and particularly the OSPAR convention uh, uh, led to uh, a range of changes which have greatly improved the water quality in the North Sea and other areas. Uh, but there were concerns about how water quality might be affecting some of the skin diseases that we were seeing in bottlenose dolphins at that time. And uh, this was uh, one of the, the early studies that we did using photography to look at uh, patterns of skin disease, not only in the Murray Firth population, but drawing comparison with other colleagues in other parts of the world. And in fact, showing that uh, one of the main drivers of variation in skin disease in these different populations that you can see we studied with the red dots on the map there was actually water temperature. Uh, one of the other important points to flag about this slide, I think, is is the importance of collaboration, uh, both within uh, different parts of the, the University of Aberdeen, but with other UK colleagues and a range of international colleagues. And much of our work has either been directly collaborating with colleagues elsewhere or drawing comparison with colleagues who are doing similar studies. And that in itself has developed a network which has created a lot of opportunities for, for students working with us to go on and work in some of these other areas. That also brought changes in uh, the level of marine protection for uh, marine mammals, both uh, seals and dolphins in this area. When we started, there was very little protection for those populations and there were no marine protected areas for marine mammals in UK waters. But another bit of international legislation, the European Union's Habitats Directive, was a real game changer there. As a result of that, the UK and other European countries have developed a network of special areas of conservation and uh, the one that uh, we're most involved with here in the Murray Firth is the bottlenose dolphin population where the work that we did has supported both the development of that special area of conservation and the monitoring programs uh, that, uh, that look at its success over the years. And this is where we use photographs of those individual dolphins to estimate trends in their population, but also to look at things such as their social structure and their reproductive success uh, and their survival. And that slide there just gives an illustration of the well, the boat that we use for our surveys each summer uh, and the uh, 
the tracks that we, we follow in, in the Inamori Firth, but also one individual's history where she's been seen over a number of years and what you can see down the, the family tree there is a series of cars she's had and, uh, and some of those grand cars. So tremendous opportunities to understand the ecology of these species. And looking back to when we first started, that was a time when people felt that you couldn't really do research on cetaceans, whales and dolphins in UK waters because they just weren't predictable enough. Uh, and now many people are carrying studies like out, studies like this um, ar around the country. One of the other things that the development of these special areas of conservation uh, meant is there was a there was a big increase in the, the data needs and need for advisory work about how different human activities might be affecting these now protected populations. And we've uh, over the last 10 years been particularly involved in uh, providing uh, data and advice to support the regulation and the management of offshore energy developments in the Murray Firth. Long history of oil and gas in the area and there's been uh, some relatively recent oil and gas exploration, but particularly now uh, the development of uh, major offshore wind farms. On the, the map on the left of that slide, you can see the grey area shaded, which is the special area of conservation for the dolphins. And you can see some red and blue lines, which were an oil and gas survey, and then the areas being developed for offshore wind. Bowl, the Beatrice farm, which is now built, Moray East, which is under construction, and Moray West, which is uh, in, in planning. And one of the big public concerns as we moved into this period uh, around 10 years ago was the possible impact of underwater noise from these different human activities. Oil and gas exploration and uh, power driving to put in the bases of the wind farms both uh, produce large levels of impulsive noise. And we knew that animals would be disturbed uh, nearby, but there was a little understanding of the scale of those effects uh, and, and how long they might last. Would they, for example, just affect animals that were offshore around the wind farm sites and the oil and gas sites, or would those effects occur further field in the coastal areas that we knew the dolphins were using and into the SAC? And that is a particularly real challenge where that lack of understanding can constrain these projects, which are themselves being developed to address other environmental impacts. And particularly here, we're looking at the importance of offshore wind in reducing some of our, our climate impacts. So over the last 10 years, we've uh, supported government and industry in developing the environmental assessments for these projects and running the, uh, the Marine Mammal Monitoring Programme that's been carried out around the, the planning and construction of uh, those, those wind farms offshore. And I'll just give you a quick flavour of uh, some of the some of the work coming out of that, uh, a paper that came out last year, which was based on uh, work carried around the Beatrice construction site. And this is where we're using passive acoustic monitoring to uh, look at the occurrence of uh, porpoises and, and the dolphins using echolocation click detectors. And the map on the right shows you the, the area that's being developed for the wind farm where there were 84 turbines uh, installed in uh, 2017, 2018. That's the piling vessel there that was, was doing that work. And each of those blue dots on that map are the location of a mooring where we have one of these echolocation detectors and we could look at changes in the occurrence of animals before and after one of these loud piling events and also measure and predict the noise levels. And the, the figure on the left shows you how the, the likelihood of a response of porpoises to that noise was very high nearby within uh, two or three kilometres, but then dropped down quite rapidly. And, and in fact, uh, much uh, much less of an impact than was originally considered in some of the more conservative environmental impact assessments. So that helps reduce some of the uncertainty uh, about these issues as we move into uh, what is now a, a growing number of offshore wind farm sites being developed, not just around the UK, but around the world. And this suite of different projects and, and others that have gone alongside it have uh, provided opportunities for a range of undergraduate and master's projects. We also have a series of PhD students who've who've carried out work in uh, in the Murray Firth and uh, have gone on to carry out uh, related studies elsewhere. Uh, but I just wanted to, to finish off highlighting just a, a few of a few of those cases and particularly uh, where we have more and more 
situations where environmental assessments require uh, advice specifically about marine mammal ecology and actually increasingly about the effects of noise and so on. Uh, that's created a lot of opportunities for some of our students to go out and make their mark. So the first one here is Kerry, who uh, carried out a project uh, working with the photo ID data a few years ago now on the, looking at the social structure and the relationships of the dolphins in the Murray Firth. And she went on to Australia to do uh, some work on humpback whales for a few years, developing her passive acoustic skills there. But she's now a marine mammal advisor for Natural Resources Wales, the, the government body in Wales, where they have a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy developments offshore as well. And in fact, a number of our students have gone on to work as marine mammal advisors in different government agencies, both uh, within the UK and, uh, uh, and in uh, North America. Another student who was working with acoustics for her masters was Tess. Uh, she was actually doing work alongside some of the early acoustic surveys that we did out, out over the uh, oil and gas and, and wind farm sites. She went on to do a, a PhD at St Andrews and is now a researcher with the Namibian Dolphin Project and has actually just been in the news in the last few weeks talking about some of the, the die-offs of uh, fur seals in Namibia. Several students have also ended up working in consultancy related uh, both to offshore energy and to marine mammal advice. Uh, Kenneth uh, worked on boat traffic uh, just in the, the mouth of the Cromarty Firth using acoustics and observations from the shore. And that's been another uh, big area of interest amongst the public and regulators as we try and make sure that the, the, the new interest in dolphins as a resource for tourism uh, doesn't interfere with their populations and, uh, and looking at how we might manage dolphin watching and boat traffic moving into these areas. And Kenneth, uh, actually soon after he graduated with his master's, went to work at Exodus initially mostly with oil and gas work advice but uh, now is uh, very heavily involved in offshore renewables. A lot of the, the early work on marine mammal ecology was based on uh, analysis of dead animals and whilst we've now got much better opportunities to uh, study them live at sea, there's still much to be learned from uh, those animals that do pitch up on the beach stranded. And uh, over the years, we've worked uh, closely with the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme, who are based in Inverness. And Marielle did a, a project working with uh, data from uh, that scheme, looking at patterns of porpoise strandings over the years. And through that project, when she was based in Cromarty, got to know the team uh, in Inverness and uh, has since been working with them and now is their data specialist as they go about trying to understand the causes of death and recording the, the strandings of different marine mammals around the, around the Scottish coast. And then finally, Jess, uh, well, another of the students who was looking at uh, interaction between boats and dolphins in the Murray Firth and uh, she's a, a self-confessed ship nerd so she she loved doing that project and uh, now she's got her dream job uh, having worked uh, with a, one of our old PhD students in uh, in the US for a while she's now working with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada on a, on a really important piece of work where they're using passive acoustics to look at the movements of uh, uh, right whales uh, one of the most endangered populations in the world and working closely with all the, the ship traffic to make sure that vessel operators know where these whales are to avoid ship strikes because it's it's known that ship strikes can be a really important cause of mortality for, for this population. And uh, you can find out more about uh, uh, that work on, on the web. So a bit of a whistle stop tour, but hopefully given you an idea of some of the some of the work we've done in relation to those those changing needs of government and interest in the public. You can find out more about the papers that I referred to in the slides on our website there uh, and also find other links to what other students have gone on to do.